Thank you, John. And thank you in general for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Welcome to you all. And judging by the crowd, I gather that Newport's Pirates are as popular as ever. My book is about two things, fundamentally. The role pirates played in Newport's colonial history and the role colonial Newport played in the history of piracy. Those are two aspects of local history that I didn't know about. I'm a native Rhode Islander. I had not heard about either thing, except as a legend. Back when I bega became interested in researching the history behind the legends that I'd known, I looked for a book about Newport's pirates. I couldn't find one. So I had to read about piracy in general and maritime history and discovered a larger story. I discovered that the story of Newport's Pirates involved colonial economy, politics, London's Navigation Acts, the role of religion in society, and greed and corruption on both sides of the Atlantic. Now that shouldn't surprise any of us. It did not surprise me. It's a very large story. It's <laughs> so large that I decided somebody should write a book. Hmm. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I did submit a proposal and History Press gave me one year to write the book. That would have been starting March of 2013 to March of 2014. Whatever research or reading I'd done previous to signing that contract was like snorkeling compared to deep sea diving. There were so many layers and so much more. And I, began, and I plunged into primary sources and newspaper articles from the time. I discovered information that wasn't in the books, any of the books I'd come across. Some, not all, but I did find some little choice pieces that I hadn't read anywhere else. My goal with the book was to put information about Newport's Pirates all in one place. It was out there in general histories. But men like Thomas II, the, the, the William Kidd connection, I brought it all together, which was the book I was looking for earlier that I didn't find. I just wanted to read a book. So it's out there now if anyone wants to read one book. My goal with this talk is to highlight aspects of the history. There's more to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do you know, the main features, the big names, and the, the, large, the large chunks uh, that relate. But, of course, there is, there's a lot more to it, and for that, I'm afraid you'll have to read the book. First thing I learned that did surprise me was that early colonial Newport, from the 1690s to the early 1700s, was a pirate haven outright. Was a pirate. They were welcomed here. They were part of the economy. Everyone knew it. The pirates knew it. Newport had the reputation, so it attracted. It attracted the pirates. London knew it which didn't sit well with London. Newporters knew it. They patronized pirates in many ways. Of course, the government, the local colonial government, denied it at every opportunity. Didn't know any pirates. Not here, not us. There were three reasons why Newport was a pirate haven. For starters, the early pirates did not attack local shipping. They attacked foreign shipping, Red Sea shipping. Madagascar was the pirate base. It was Red Sea shipping, so it was uh, the Great Mogul, it was Muslim shipping. It was, not, it was not Christian shipping, which was part of the reason why there was no problem accepting the goods here. But it was foreign. It didn't affect any local commerce. Everyone in the colony profited, not only from the goods that were sold on the black market and through, well, sometimes auctioned openly on the dock, but also from the currency that pirates brought in, gold and silver currency. Currency was a scarce commodity in the colony. London liked it like that. They kept it that way. London's navigation acts were designed to enrich the motherland at the expense of the colonies. The colonists had no, uh, the, the colonists did everything they could to get around those navigation acts. They had no intention of being economically under the heel of London. So everyone profited. The third, uh, and I think one of the main reasons why Newport became a pirate haven was because of our harbor. It was then what it still is, an exceptional harbor. Of course, it looked very different in the 1690s through the early 1700s, but it, it's, it's the main features were there. This slide is uh, Newport Harbor circa 1740, approximately. 
It's a private collection. Aletta Morris Cooper has graciously loaned it to the Preservation Society, so you can see it at the Hunter House. You can see the actual painting. Uh, it was rescued from a house that was torn down on, I believe, Mill Street. It was an overmantel painting from back in the day. So there you have, basically, in the foreground, that's Goat Island with Fort George firing its guns. Farther up, about two-thirds up, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to have to generally indicate things. My, my little pointer didn't work on, on this screen, so you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, there's, a, there's a spit of land jutting out from the, from the left-hand side of the painting. That is Gravelly Point, which features hugely in the story of Newport Pirates. The Gravelly Point Pirates, they were executed on that spit of land. That is what it looked like from in the early 1700s. There's a body of water beyond that spit of land. That's called the basin. It's no longer there. It's been filled in. The point section has been built up on the basin. The Marriott Hotel is somewhere on the coast of that basin. You'll notice empty space between Gravelly Point and the town. Empty space where Long Wharf is today. It was not there in the early 1700s. It was built after 1740. It connected the the city of Newport to the end of Gravelly Point. Today, if you go down Long Wharf to the end, you'll come to a corner where Washington Street is. That is essentially the, the path that it took back in the day. Of course, Washington Street didn't exist because Washington didn't exist, so it was called First Street. But that's the harbor. You will notice all kinds of shipping in this, in this depiction. Those would be merchant ships, coastal traders, warships, privateers, and pirates. <coughs> this is an early map of Rhode Island and Providence plantations. Most of you know that we are the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations, generally known as Rhode Island. We were also the colony of Rhode Island and Providence plantations. I include this map in my book and here because what many Rhode Islanders aren't always aware of is that the Rhode Island part of that title referred specifically to Aquidneck Island, which you can see, you know, it's sort of in the mid, mid, mid to right of the map. Ah, do we have a magic pointer? pointer? Oh, oh. Does it work? <laughs> see, it works on the ceiling very well, but then when I come down to the screen, it's, it loses. Yeah, I don't know. I will just talk on. If anybody, if, if, you know, if you, if you don't see it, tell me, but Rhode Island is clearly indicated as a Quidnic Island. We are on Coasters Island, of course, which is uh, sort of the bottom third of that Rhode Island, a Quidnic Island piece. Newport Harbor is on the southernmost end. In the cl early colonial period, it was simply Newport and Portsmouth occupied the island of Rhode Island. The Providence Plantations part referred to the mainland. And in the colonial period, the mainland was the towns of Providence and Warwick. I'm so glad it's not mine. So it's, it's good to know this because when you read any documents from the colonial period and they refer to Rhode Island, they mean Aquidneck Island. They don't mean the whole thing like we call the state of Rhode Island. They mean Aquidneck Island. So any reference to Rhode Island means Aquidneck Island. Newport was the colonial capital. So if they talk about the government of Rhode Island, they mean Newport. The governor resided in Newport. This was the colonial capital. <clears throat> That's why I include the map in the book and like to, uh, like to remind everybody of, that, of those things because there's an awful lot of references to Rhode Island that are deceptive if, unless you bear in mind that the Aquidneck Island was what they meant. This is a definition of piracy. At this point, piracy means a lot of things beyond the original meaning in terms of English law. Originally, it was defined to be a robbery committed within the jurisdiction of the Admiralty. Pirates were sea <coughs> robbers, sea robbers as opposed to highway robbers. That's all it meant, simply that. I uh, printed this up in the book because John Valentine, the Advocate General at the Gravelly Point Pirates trial, defined piracy for the court. This is his definition. <coughs> And again, the Gravelly Point Pirate story is huge, so his definition will be the, one, the working definition that we will have for today. Thomas II, Red Sea Pirate. What Newporter doesn't know Thomas II rum? And, and the story basically of Thomas II. He is the first 
uh, Newport native son that made it made a name for himself in piracy. He in this image, this is this is this is uh, an uh, illustration from Harper's Magazine, 1894. So clearly, we don't really know what Thomas II looked like. He is the man facing us in this image. We have a verbal description of Thomas II that has survived from the time. And I have to say, Howard Pyle got it pretty right. He was c described as being slim, dark, and a sharp dresser. I mean, the description of his dress includes gold lace, uh, uh, jewel-encrusted dagger. It's, it's in the book. It's a wonderful description. That would be him facing us. The man he's sitting with is Governor Fletcher, New York's Governor Fletcher. Governor Fletcher was a pirate patron, as was Governor Sam Cranston in Newport, in, in, well, in, in the colony of, of Rhode Island. Governor Fletcher, though, I think he set the bar for pirate patronage. Uh, Piracy wouldn't have survived without patronage at every level. Fletcher basically uh, granted privateering commissions to captains that everyone knew, knew had no intention of going privateering. That's part of being a pirate patron. You grant a privateering commission for a fee. Maybe it's a bribe. Maybe it's a gift. There was money to be made no matter what. And for, you know, for investors, having that private for a private to have a privateering commission, it attracted investors and gave a veneer of legitimacy to the operation. So Thomas too received his privateering commission, his second commission. He took a second trip to the Red Sea. He received it from Governor Fletcher. Thomas II's first trip to the Red Sea was in 1693. He went to sea as a very young man, got a reputation for piracy fairly early on, but he was also a privateer, as many of them were. Uh, his first commission came from, I believe it was Bermuda, and it was actually it was a legitimate it was a legitimate commission to fight French pirates in, on the African the west coast of Africa. But on the way, he and his crew changed their mind. It's a long story, but to be short, they changed their mind. They decided to scrap that mission and go pirating in the Red Sea, which they did very successfully. They came back wealthy men. Returned to Newport in 1694. They were feted like rock stars. They, they were very popular from, with everyone, from the governor straight through to common citizens who were happy to buy the exotic goods that they stole from Red Sea shipping. In 1694, Thomas II had no trouble attracting men interested in going out on a second voyage to the Red Sea to make their fortunes. Five ships left Newport that year. Two of them were captained by Newporters, Thomas II and William Mays. More about William Mays in a minute. There were three other ships. The five Newport ships met up with and partnered with a man named John Avery, Long Ben Avery, who was another notorious pirate. John Avery was already in the Red Sea. He'd been pirating for some time. He was very successful. He had a larger ship, more experience. The Newport has partnered with him, which didn't go so well for them. Because, well, it didn't go so well because they were very successful. The first ship they attacked was one owned by the Great Mogul, so it was a fabulous prize. I think they spent three days looting it uh, and abusing the crew and the, and the passengers. They, they made a terrible reputation for themselves and for English pirates in general in the Red Sea. And after three days of pillaging, the great mogul, his subjects, and London's East India Company, London's East India Company had a partnership with the great mogul. They were all thoroughly disgusted with English pirates in the Red Sea. The East India Company complained to London. The attacks drew London's wrath. And that, in part, inspired the commissioning of a man named Captain William Kidd to go on a pirate hunting expedition in the Red Sea and the Caribbean, but the Red Sea as well. Two men's names come up at the very top of the list of Captain Kidd's commission, Thomas II and William Mays. They were both named outright as among the, the men that, that Captain Kidd would be looking for. Kidd set out in 1696. Before he got anywhere near the Red Sea, Thomas II was killed during an attack on a Muslim ship. Thomas II never made it home from that second voyage. But William Mays did. <coughs> William Mays, Jr. 
Captain William Mays, Jr., born and raised in Newport. His father was William Mays, Sr., who owned the White Horse Tavern for years in Newport. It was then and is now on Marlboro Street. We all know it as one of Newport's fabulous restaurants. It's in the same location. It's a very different building than it would have been in the 1690s when William Mays lived there. You can picture something more like the Wanton Lyman Hazard House, if you're familiar with it in town. It's a very scaled back colonial inn and tavern. But this is where William Mays Jr. grew up. He, s he managed to survive to in a, f a few more years after, well, after, after Thomas II was killed. He survived pirating in the Red Sea. The way that worked was the, the uh, Madagascar was a pirate base. Pirates, English pirates and others, came and went into the, from the Red Sea back and forth to Madagascar to provision, sell their goods. Goods were fenced, sent to predominantly New York, Governor Fletcher, predominantly, but not exclusively. Uh, materials were shipped from New York to Madagascar, things that the pirates needed, shoes, ammunition, food, so it was sort of a working relationship back and forth across the Atlantic. William Mays set himself up for several years pirating in the Red Sea in that Madagascar, New York, New England connection. He'd, he'd been back and forth a few times. In 1698, an act of grace designed to discourage piracy uh, it came from London, one of several. But also, Governor Fletcher was replaced. London, part of London's crackdown was to replace New York's Governor Fletcher with Lord Bellamont, a royally appointed governor in New York. Lord Bellamont was a pirate nemesis. He was one of Captain Kidd's sponsors. There were Lord Bellamont and several other aristocratic sponsors. King William was also a sponsor. But Lord Bellamont was now governor of New York. Massachusetts and New Hampshire as well, but certainly New York, which meant that the business between New York and Madagascar slowed to a crawl. A lot of pirates left Madagascar at that time, and some of them who came from New England returned to New England. William Mays returned to Newport. He took over the family business, eventually inherited the White Horse Tavern, and he died in Newport in 1702. He is buried in the common burial ground, one of the few pirates that actually is buried here. I could not find his stone, but I did find William Mays Sr.'s stone in the Mays family plot. And there are other stones that are toppled and illegible. One of those is William Mays Jr. Captain Kidd sails to Block Island. <laughs> Captain Kidd's story is huge and complicated. I would not even pretend to try to cover it in my book. It is covered and I have references if anyone wants to read more thoroughly about it. But I, I covered his connection to Rhode Island. He set out from London in 1696. By 1698, with very little to show for his efforts, he returned to the Caribbean, thinking he'd come home and go back to his life as a wealthy merchant, happily married in New York. But in 1698, in the Caribbean, he learned he was wanted for piracy, which came as a great surprise to him. As I said, he had royal backers. Lord Bellamont, other arist aristocrats, even the king. They were royal backers. He figured his reputation was secure. It was not. He wanted to cover, cover his bases so that when he showed up on the mainland, he wanted his name cleared so that he wouldn't be arrested for piracy and sent back to London. So he came to Rhode Island, Pirate Haven. He had friends here, the logical thing to do. In 1699, now you can see where Block Island is, you know, sort of down in the lower right-hand corner of that slide. It's where it still is, off the east coast of Long Island. Just to the left of Block Island, on the very coast of, of Long Island, is a little place called Gardner's Island. What Captain Kidd did, he anchored off Block Island, where he had friends, sent for his wife and daughter, sent for a friend, a, a lawyer from New York, to find Lord Bellamont, who was now the governor of Massachusetts and in Massachusetts. He you know, sent this lawyer ahead to clear his name. But he also wanted to bury his treasure, most of the treasure that he brought back with him. He wanted buried. He, had, he, he was sailing a small sloop at the time. He arranged to bury this treasure on Gardner's Island, which I showed you was just, you know, he sailed from Block Island little to the west of Gardner's Island. 
This next slide is totally gratuitous. I love it. I had to include it. Looks nothing like Captain Kidd. He was actually a very respectable looking, uh, sort of a burger looking, you know, tidy man. But this is, this is an illustration uh, uh, done for Howard Pyle's Book of Pirates. But it's Kid Burying Treasure. Picture him on Gardner's Island burying treasure. Which he did do, most of it. But then after burying treasure on Gardner's Island, he had uh, some gold, uh, gold bars in particular, that he wanted separate, separately hidden for his wife at the home of a friend of his named Captain Thomas Paine. He's, Captain Thomas Paine is another name that comes up as a, as a large figure in Newport's history for several reasons. Excuse me. <coughs> he was a privateer and a pirate from the Caribbean, came to Rhode Island to retire which he managed to do, gifts, bribes, bought his way into the community. And he became a farmer on Connecticut Island, Jamestown. Captain Kidd sailed, to, sailed off the shore of Jamestown, an anchored not too far from Payne's house, and brought Payne out to his ship to ask him if he would hide gold for his wife, Sarah Kidd which Payne agreed to do. This is Captain Thomas Payne's farmhouse <coughs> as it appears today. Thomas Payne uh, knew an awful lot of, of, of uh, questionable characters. He hid treasure for many. Kidd was one of them. I have to tell you, this, this is as it appears today. Again, in the colonial times, it was a very modest farmhouse. It's private property. There is no treasure there. And I don't encourage anyone to find it and, and show up with shovels. Trust me, whatever was buried there has long since been dug up, including the gold bars for the gold bars for Sarah Kidd. Payne arrived in 1683, arrived in Newport, became a model citizen. In fact, this was total news to me. He led the colony, the colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, in its first naval victory. In 1690, French privateers, pirates, however you want to refer to them, attacked local shipping and Block Island. There's an eyewitness account of the battle that, that ensued between Thomas Paine and, and, another, and another captain. It's an eyewitness account in the book. Paine and another man were commissioned to go out and hunt, hunt those pirates, which they did successfully. They routed them. They came back to the colony, to Newport, as naval heroes, first naval victory in the colony, and his reputation was secure. Eventually, Paine was one of the founders of Trinity Church, and not the only one with a dicey reputation. In 1698, 16 men petitioned the king to send an Angli Anglican minister to Newport. Five of those men's men had connections to piracy. Thomas Paine and George Cutler were the only two that were actually retired pirates. George Cutler's story is also included in the book. <coughs> Payne was from the Caribbean, Cutler was from the Red Sea. They were honest to goodness retired pirates. The other three men had connections, but they were not pirates. Thomas Mallet was a Newport innkeeper and sheriff who entertained pirates in his tavern. It's well documented, had no problem being sheriff and, having, and serving these guys drinks and having them socialize. Robert Gardner is another founder, original signer of that, that petition. He was the deputy collector of customs in Newport and a naval officer. He was accused by Lord Bellamont of piracy. The accusations were never proved. They never stuck. So we don't know. But we do know that Robert Gardner definitely did business with pirates. That document, documentation is clear. Robert Wrightington is the, the, the last of, of the five. He was a privateer, a legitimate privateer who settled in Newport, no connection to piracy himself, but he had a stepson named George Bradley, who was accused of piracy. Bradley was captured by Bartholomew M Roberts and either forced or volunteered to serve. We don't know for sure. History is not clear. What is clear is that Bradley never returned to Newport. He had a wife and child here. He never returned to Newport. Another name that comes up is C.N. Arnold. It's S-I-O-N, as you see. I, I 
Cian, Cyan, I honestly don't know. I call him Cian. If anyone here knows different, feel free. He was a Red Sea pirate, not a captain. He was a Red Sea pirate. And the grandson of Governor Benedict Arnold. I'm showing the Old Stone Mill in Newport, Rhode Island, because that was part, the, part of Governor Arnold's original farm, his original colonial farm. And of course, it's Toro Park and a landmark, a local landmark. Cian returned to Newport in 1698, that act of grace, business not so good between Madagascar and New York. He came home too. Lord Bellamont was in the middle of an investigation of the colony's connections, connections to, to Captain Kidd and piracy in general in 1698. He had a commission set up to investigate connections to piracy. Cian was investigated for piracy and set free by this commission. It probably didn't hurt that two of Cian's uncles by the name of Arnold served on the commission to investigate Rhode Island's connection to piracy. So, probably didn't hurt. Eventually, Cian inherited a farm on, at Beavertail on Connecticut. No further run-ins with the law, another model citizen. Pirates were very complicated men, I learned. It's not a simple story of evildoers and, well, partly evildoers, but not a simple story. Paul's Grave Williams. This name was brand new to me. His family uh, settled, were part of the original settlers on Block Island. He became a jeweler and settled in Newport, wife and children. His father, John Williams, was one of Rhode Island's, served as uh, Rhode Island's Attorney General at some point, colonial period. Paul's Grave was the last Newport pirate captain. He came into piracy through the back door. Apparently, he wasn't really happy being a settled man in, <coughs> in, in Newport with a wife and family because he met Sam Bellamy, black Sam Bellamy, in 1716 in a Provincetown bar, which is why I'm ha I have this map. It shows Block Island all the way up to, to uh, Cape Cod and with Provincetown at the upper tip. He and Sam Bellamy hit it off. <coughs> Bellamy was a mariner born in, born in England, came to Provincetown, he was a man of the sea. He had experience. He could captain a ship. Paul Williams was a jeweler, which effectively made him a banker. He had, he, had, he had assets that he could invest in a ship. They became partners. They bought a ship and went to the Caribbean to seek their fortune. Spent about a year pirating very successfully. Met up with a man named Hornigold major name in Caribbean piracy. One of his protégés was Blackbeard. They met up with him and learned, learned, learned the ropes and became very successful pirates. Sam Bellamy's name is familiar because he eventually, he and Williams, eventually captured a ship called the Widow. It was a slave ship out of London, came to the Caribbean, dropped off its, well dropped off, sold its cargo and was heading back to London. They captured the ship on her way back to London. Fabulous prize, fabulous wealth. And when I say wealth, it, it came in the form of whatever was traded for the slaves, including it would have been gold and silver, it would have been uh, raw gems, it would have been um, you know, elephant tusk, I mean, it was whatever, whatever goods would have been traded for slaves at the time. Captain Bellamy took over the widow as captain, and Williams was, was named captain of the other ship in their fleet at the time. The widow was eventually wrecked in a storm on the coast of Cape Cod, the Atlantic coast of Cape Cod. It was lost for years, recently discovered. There's a pirate museum in Provincetown that has the, um, a, a lot of artifacts dug up from that ship. That was, that was Sam Bellamy's ship, Paul Williams' partner, Sam Bellamy. On that sail north from the Caribbean, Williams broke off from Bellamy during the storm, a different storm, and went to Block Island to visit family. So he was not caught in yet that second storm. He was not caught in that storm that wrecked that wrecked Sam Bellamy's ship. He was alive and well in Block Island. Heard about the storm, sailed up to Provincetown, well, to find if, if he could rescue any crewmates, fellow crewmates, but I'm sure he also went to see if he could salvage any of the treasure. He was unsuccessful on both counts. There was nothing really that, that he could do. So he left, continued pirating down the Atlantic coast, eventually settled in the Bahamas. This would have been uh, by 1717, uh, that was the wreck, the wreck of the widow. This is at the end of the golden age of piracy. 
It's important to note that Williams and Bellamy, along with other Caribbean pirates at the time, were attacking colonial ships, including Newport ships. They were no longer attacking foreign shipping exclusively. They attacked local shipping. They made enemies up and down the coast, including the colony, this colony of, of Rhode Island. So Newport had changed its attitude towards pirates at this time. In fact, they, they tried to chase, uh, trace down uh, Williams when he was on his way from Promise Town back south. And they couldn't, they didn't catch up with him. But the tide had turned, which brings us to one of our favorite stories, the Gravelly Point Pirates. This is an old map uh, that is, it's very revealing because as you can see, mid, midway on the left-hand side, you can see the basin of water. You can see Long Wharf now that is built. It's a wooden wharf. There's a little drawbridge that allows access to the basin. And it ends at what is now Washington Street. That's that little bubble of land to the right of Long Wharf. That is Gravelly Point. And Goat Island is, of course, with, with Fort George, is in the foreground of that map. As I said, the basin is now filled. So is Gravelly Point. There's it's been built up several times over the years. To my best guess is that the Newport Yacht Club and the Wyndham Hotel, I think it's called, sit side by side on what was Gravelly Point. That is my best guess, given this map. And of course, this is a 1777 map, so in 1723, Long Wharf didn't exist. Other than that, that's pretty much what the harbor looked like. Captain Charles Harris and the crew of the <coughs> Ranger were the uh, were the pirates that were captured and executed off Gravelly Point. <clears throat> they were Caribbean pirates. They partnered with a man named Ned Lowe. He was positively sadistic, Ned Lowe. Th this, this crew, Harris and Lowe, had a horrible reputation up and down the coast. Everyone knew of them. Uh, there, are, there are newspaper articles from the time that document the treatment of prisoners. They had an ugly reputation. So, and they attacked local shipping. In 1723, both Lowe and Harris were seen off Block Island. A man of war from New York pursued them within sight of land, which I find fascinating, which means if you were standing in the right place, you could have watched this battle unfold. There's an account of the battle in the book. There was a newspaper article <coughs> published at the time. It's, it's just, it's very revealing. Ned Lowe escaped. Harris and his crew were captured, obviously, but Ned Lowe escaped. 36 men survived the battle, Harris and, and a crew of 35. They were jailed in Newport and tried in the townhouse, which is where the colony house sits today at the top of, of Washington Square. The townhouse used to sit there. That was where the trial took place. 26 were found guilty, including a man named William Blades, who uh, was described as a Rhode Islander, which to me, again, means he was probably from Newport. William Blades was found guilty and hung at Gravelly Point the only Rhode Islander ever executed for piracy, ever tried and executed for piracy in the colony. After the men were hung at Gravelly Point, <coughs> they were rowed out to the north end of Goat Island to be buried. And that is a picture of the north end of Goat Island as it appears today. They're buried, you know, I, I'm not sure what of, of, of this is filled since the time, but I'm guessing somewhere under those rocks or just the side of those rocks is where they were originally buried, between the high and low water mark, weighed down with bags, bags of sand. Oh, I, have, I am so excited about this. This is the printed text of the Gravelly Point Pirates trial. It's, uh, I found it at the Rhode Island Historical Society. It's an original 1723 document. I have seen printed texts cover pages of all kinds of pirate trials, but never the Gravelly Point one. So when I discovered that the Rhode Island Historical Society had a copy and they actually let me look at it, touch it, flip through it. I'd read the account of the trial, so I didn't have to linger. But it was, it was really exciting to find this. I, it's reproduced in the book. You won't find it reproduced anywhere else, to my knowledge, because I didn't. The Admiralty Court, London's Admiralty Court, insisted on printed accounts of pirate trials. Printers, publishers discovered that there was a popular appetite for this reading material, which is why so many were printed and why this one survived. And again, I can't thank the Historical Society enough for allowing that to be put in the book. The burning of the Gatsby, pirating for liberty. Every Rhode Island school child has heard of the Gatsby. 
and that Rhode Island, as far as we're concerned, Rhode Island struck the first blow for liberty before the Revolutionary War was declared. The Gatsby enters the story in 1772 as, an as a British enforcement ship to prevent smuggling, collect taxes, and seize goods brought into the colony illegally. Newport's merchants were very good, Rhode Island merchants and Newport's merchants were very good at finding their way around the Navigation Acts to bring goods into the colony illegally. There were, there were three other confrontations before the Gatsby. Be, uh, considering the offenses, well, the offenses on London side were press gangs, pressing sailors into service, which <laughs> was not received well by the colony, but also seizing ships and cargo illegally. As far as the colony was concerned, seizing ships and cargo illegally is an act of piracy. So they accused London of piracy throughout that time and, and three other confrontations before the Gatsby had occurred which resulted in, in the, the colonists retaliating, stealing longboats, burning them, torching another ship even before the Gatsby. So of course London also accused the colonists of piracy. They were both right. According to the definition of piracy, London was guilty in their way and the colonists were guilty in their way. The story of the Gatsby began when she chased a ship from Newport Harbor to Providence. The ship became stranded at low tide in the middle of the night on what is now Gatsby Point. The colonists wounded the captain and took all hands prisoner and then destroyed the vessel, burned the Gatsby. London accused the perpetrators of both piracy and treason. Both crimes were punishable by death, but treason for, for treason you had to be shipped to London for trial and execution. Well, it was pretty much a, a, a done deal once you were shipped to London for trial and execution. So uh, London was, was very anxious to get their hands on the perpetrators and the colony, everyone from the governor down, protected the identities of the perpetrators. And the identities were well known. John Brown, you know, the Brown family. Uh, he organized the, the whole affair and two of his captains were involved in it, were leaders in the affair. Those would be Abraham Whipple and Isaac Hopkins. They were both involved. They both figure in a large way in the history of, of colonial piracy, uh, colonial, I'm sorry, the colonial naval history, excuse me, not piracy. Had they been arrested at the time and shipped to London, they would have been executed. They would not have lived to play that role. They were protected and, and lived on. Whipple, of course, was put in, in command of the first two ships of the Continental Navy, one of which was the Providence, eventually the Providence, whose replica sits, calls uh, Newport Harbor home. And the, the, Prov the, the sloop Providence is, is uh, it's in the harbor. You can take a sail on her. We did this summer. It was very exciting. She is Rhode Island's official flagship. And it's as close as you'll get to a sail on a Continental Navy ship for that matter, even a pirate ship, because sloops were very popular pirate ships. Captain Kidd sailed a sloop from the Caribbean to Narragansett Bay. Captain Two sailed a sloop from Newport to the Red Sea. And the Gravelly Point pirates were arrested, were, were captured on a pirate sloop, on a sloop. I have to say, this is one good looking cat. Roswell is his name. Roswell is one of two's cats. The last chapter of my book is dedicated to the legends that actually drew my attention. Uh, Roswell lives next door to me in Newport. He's a polydactyl, a many-toed cat. You all know, of course, that uh, cats in general were welcome on board ships. They needed them to hunt rodents. Superstitious sailors believed that many-toed cats were better at everything, including hunting rodents, so they were very popular as, as, uh, as mascots. If you've been to Key West, you're familiar with Hemingway's cats. They're all polydactyl cats, a gift originally from a, a, she, a ship captain. They're all descended from that original gift to Hemingway. So, okay, in Key West, they're called Hemingway's cats. In Newport, we call them Two's cats. He's here to remind me that there are so many legends, uh, you know, of the, of the legends. He's one of them, uh, bar buried treasure, pirate ghosts, a, a love story. They're all in the last chapter of the book. It's fun reading. And as I said, it is what, it is what got me into this. As far as I'm concerned, uh, Newport Pirates left a legacy, a part of Rhode Island's history that's been ignored. They helped the colony survive economically. To be fair, it was piracy and smuggling. 
they will share the credit. But they helped the colony survive economically. They originally pirated for profit, and as we've seen later pirates, pirated for liberty. <laughs> After pirates fell out of favor, Newport buried that aspect of her history. I dug it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your interest. We, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Happy to answer anything. Okay, there's a woman. Yes. Yes. Charles Harris trial, um, you mentioned that William Blades was a was definitely a native Rhode Islander. Yes. But Charles Harris was a, as well. He was not. He was not. He was born in England. The, uh, the there was I, I don't have it in front of me, but the published list of the pirates themselves and where they came from was published in the newspapers at the time. And it's in the book. I, I honestly just don't remember what town in England. But he came from England. He was captured by William Lowe, uh, a, name, a man named Edward Lothar and Lowe. I mean, it's, this is the Caribbean story. They, he was captured off a British, I think it was a merchant mariner. I don't think it was a warship. He was captured and forced into service with Lowe. He, he, he loved the life and proved to be such a, a good hand that they kept him on it. He volunteered eventually as a pirate and became a captain of, of a ship there as well. So William Blades is the only Rhode Islander. There's another man, I think his first name was Thomas, his last name was Mumford for sure. He was uh, from uh, the vineyard. He was a, a, a Wampanoag Indian. Those are the only two that I remember with a connection to New England. Okay, and um, was, was that trial in July of, was it 1723? At the time, was that the largest mass pirate canyon in, in Mass execution of any kind. Of any kind. In in the colonies, I and I, I could be wrong. I have read that it's that rec that still stands as the largest execution even in these United States. As a mass execution now, twenty six men. That's a lot of men. <laughs> yes. You started us with the definition of, of of piracy as robbery on the high seas. Yes. From Valentine. Yes. Is that a British definition of piracy? Well, because it's uh, you know within the jurisdiction of the Admiralty, that is how it was phrased for British law. Yes. Okay. So then the commissions that were given, uh, what was the source of the commissions? Commissions for. The commissions that were, that were given to, to by privateering. Oh, privateering commissions. Both uh, both in England. I mean, this this the privateering commission precedent was was established in England and in Europe. All of the nations did this. This is how they augmented their navies during war, and they were always at war. That tradition be came across the Atlantic. Commissions for colonial captains were issued by colonial governors. Many legitimate privateering commissions were issued by colonial governors, uh, starting in 1650, actually. And, and, and that relieved them from, from prosecution as being robbers. Well, it depends on whether or not they stuck to the terms of their commission, which, m again, you know, I don't want to say every privateer became a pirate, but the p people played fast and loose with the rules, didn't they? I mean, if, if um, life was hard, if, a, if an opportunity presented itself and the captain and crew were in agreement and they chose to a to attack a ship that England was not necessarily at war with, you know, from a country that England, well, they may have done that. Maybe they made a mistake. Maybe somebody was flying the wrong flag. You know what I'm saying? It was all very fluid. But legitimate commissions were legitimate privateering commissions. Uh, Thomas II did not even pretend uh, to be a pirate. Uh, to, I'm sorry, to be a legitimate privateer. Uh, William Mays did not, but many other men did. Yes, is someone way in back? Yeah, you mentioned the women. Um, yes. I did mostly women research on that. Uh, the first on the Oh, wow. And interesting that it's saying. That's right. That's right. They tried. There were there were two ships that wrecked: the Widow and another, a Pink. And I can't. The Marianne, I think her name was Marianne. The uh, all right. Pirates from the Marianne actually made it to shore because they, she wrecked closer to shore and they didn't drown. And they yes, they were they wanted to meet up with Paul's Grave Williams in Rhode Island, so they started to walk. They were arrested. I, that's charming that they would even consider doing that. Yes, someone else. Yes, sir. Uh, I understood there were many letters of Mark issued. Yeah. Was there a lot of activity by the uh, so-called honest pirates? 
<coughs> honest pirates. You mean honest pir privateers. There's that, uh, that is well documented. Privateering, uh, there's a reference in my book, in my bibliography, to uh, a, a man named Shepard, uh, published a document for the Rhode Island Historical Society that, that uh, lists privateers from the colonial period through the revolution, past the revolution, into the early, early 1800s. It's well documented, legitimate privateering is well documented. And it's, it involved a letter of mark, that is what the commission meant, uh, a letter of mark and retribution, I believe. Uh, which meant that you were privateering on behalf of your government against an enemy, an enemy uh, combatant. And it's, it's well documented. It's just some of them played fast and loose with the rules, and others, again, a few that I've mentioned, got those commissions uh, with no intention of, of being a legitimate privateer. Okay? The treatment of the crew and passengers of the ships that were taken uh, how well, how bad were they treated? That's an interesting story because it varied it, it, to very well to atrocious, from very well to atrocious. It had to do with, uh, with two things. Pirates would fight to the death if they were being attacked. But when they fought, when they tracked down a prey and fought to, to, to rob that ship and, that, and, 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 and the contents, they did not want to fight. They wanted the crew to, uh, to surrender without a fight because they didn't want to risk personal injury, but they didn't want to risk losing that ship and the treasure aboard. A damaged ship or a sunken ship was of no value to them. If the crew behaved well, the captain and crew surrendered without a fight, as happened with the widow, they surrendered without a fight, they were treated exceedingly well. In fact, they were given one of the lesser ships from, uh, from Bellamy's fleet to sail home in and he took over their ship. When they fought back or hid treasure, they, could have, they, they risked being <coughs> tortured or mur and or murdered. Ned Lowe was particularly vicious in that regard. He, he, his stories, uh, you know, that was Captain Harris's partner. His stories are bone chilling and uh, his end was, well, it's, a, it's a story unto itself. It, it, I, I glanced through it in the book. I didn't go into great detail because he was not from the neighborhood. But he was connected to Harris, so it depends. Oh, another, th another feature was, they would, uh, the pirates would ask, how did the captain behave towards the crew? They would ask the crew members privately, was he a good captain, your captain? His fate depended on that judgment of the crew. Because so many of the men that turned to piracy turned to it because they had been abused themselves by either naval captains or, or, or merchant mariner captains. They had been abused. It's a class system. You know, uh, uh, aristocrats became... The, the masters of ships, common seamen were drawn from the lower classes, common seamen were treated like dirt, treated like dogs. So if they found a captain who the crew gave a favorable report on, that captain would normally be treated well, Ned Lowe's an exception, but then he was horrible. Normally the captain's, but if, but if they, he got a bad report, that captain, uh, torture and death was probably in his, so I've already heard from you, is there someone else? And if not, I'll go back to you. Okay, go ahead. Yes, sir. Did any of these uh, pirates ever become politicians? No! <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, I'm trying to remember. Some of them, well, uh, all right. Uh, Thomas Paine is, is an example. He, um, oh, and I can't remember. Uh, I did document it. He, he, uh, he served in several capacities on, on Connecticut Island, uh, captain of the guard, different things. But yeah, but yeah well, would that surprise us if pirates became politicians? No, but they're, they're, they became a lot of other, they became respectable landowners, uh, again, founders of Trinity Church, and they meant it. They, they were there in the pew every Sunday. They were not just, just doing this for show. They were very complicated men. I, I became very intrigued by the makeup of the men that survived long enough to play a role on shore. They were very interesting men. Good and bad. Way in back, yes. I think you're the only one in back. You, sir, yes. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, I was just thinking of where, did they ever find any of that treasure on Gosses Island? <laughs> uh, it was, it's well documented in, in uh, a book about, about buried treasure. John Gardner himself turned that treasure over to Lord Bellamont, and it is, he had receipts, he had um, a full list of everything that was buried there, and he did turn it over to Lord Bellamont, and it was sent to London. Uh, it's interesting to note that most of his treasure went towards lawyer fees, uh, 
uh, all kinds of lower members of the court got their share. You know, it, it was pretty much uh, squandered away. Sarah Kidd, though, did, uh, Captain Payne, did keep his promise. He kept those gold bars for Sarah Kidd, and when she needed them, she got them from him. He was more or less scapegoated, wasn't he? By Kidd. Him? in Boston, sent to England? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, William Kidd was. That's exactly my conclusion about him. He was, uh, he was scapegoated. It was a political scapegoat. He had to go. Uh, the, the best book on his story is by a man named Zax. I can't remember his first name called uh, Pirate Hunter, the true story of Captain Kidd. It, it's the most comprehensive book and it documents in great detail his journey from start to finish. You know. Yes. I understood that some of the pirates helped found uh, Trinity Church. Yes. Because uh, they, if they were a member of the church, they could get a government job. That's what I heard. Well, uh, th that could be true. I never read that. But uh, being a member of any the church, the that if, if he mentioned it, then it's true. If, if, if Professor Hattendorf said so, then I would go with that. Absolutely. <laughs> I would not argue with that. <laughs> any, yes, again. Yes, miss. We do not. And that is one of those treasure hunting stories that people kind of bandy about. He, uh, his, he left a will, and, and, it's, and it was very modest. You know, what, 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 what his, whoever he left it to, it was very modest goods. Um, you know, if he spent it all, I mean, uh, pirates weren't given to saving for a rainy day. People at the time, and generally, generally they weren't. There were no banks. So that's why uh, folks in the community like Thomas Paine, uh, who were trusted to, to keep treasures uh, secreted away for associates, uh, that, that's why they could do that, because there were no banks where you could hand in your gold bars or whatever else you, you might have had. So chances are whatever he earned, he spent. He probably didn't bury it because they didn't tend to. They invested it, again, like you know, in land or in businesses, but there were no banks. There was no way to really hold on. And, and, and uh, you know, what, what can I say? Loose women and hard liquor. I mean, it's one of those stories that, uh, I mean, even, even when, when two first returned to Newport from that first voyage, he returned fabulously wealthy. He could have retired in Newport and never, uh, you know, lived, lived, a, lived a life. But uh, many of his crew members who also came back fabulously wealthy went through their money in a matter of months, which was why they all wanted to make that second voyage. Aside from the fact that I'm, I'm guessing they just had salt water in their veins. They, they, they weren't land lovers. They wanted to be out there. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>